So welcome to this last day of the summer school. Just for the people who will be watching this on YouTube, they need to know that this is the last day, uh, a Friday morning, after very intense courses and uh, beer sessions. <laughs> so it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Bart. We've been uh, collaborating now for quite uh, some time. <laughs> And let's say the, the big lesson I always learned from this collaboration is that when, when we are looking in cardiology, we typically as engineers, we want to, quant to quantify like one parameter. And this is always, uh, I mean, this parameter can have many names, but it's always the same concept. Like it can be ejection fraction, or you call it the global longitudinal strain, or you call it wall shear stress. And we, we assume that this is a good descriptor to actually understand uh, a disease. And what, what I learned from Bart is that it's, of course, far too simplistic. And that what we should do is more to look at the mechanism and to understand what are the mechanisms that make a healthy heart, in this case, um, become pathological in the sense that what are the mechanisms uh, used by the cardiovascular system to cope with an adverse situation. And what I'm always amazed is to see the capacity of the heart to adapt, uh, to see that in the first time these changes are actually uh, good, <laughs> but that there is always a point where they become non-reversible. And so I think the talk today is going to be about that in a very specific context, which is the fetal imaging and modeling. So thank you very much, Bart. Thank you very much for the kind words, Mathieu. I think it was, at least for me, a pleasure up to now to be here at the summer school. And I already learned a lot. We had good discussions. And I want to contribute a little bit with the discussions by talking about fetal cardiovascular changes and especially also the role of modeling. And when you talk about cardiovascular modeling, this is like a typical pipeline that you will see where people start from data, try to get patient-specific kind of geometries, embed microinformation, some other information that you have, things that we cannot measure maybe, like Bocchini systems or fibers or things like that, and then start to do simulations in order to do therapy. Well, actually, this is not what I'm going to talk about today. Because what I'm going to talk about today is what I want to do is I want to start from the problem and see how we can, starting from the problem, try to go step by step in trying to understand and the problem is that while well, all of us are born at some point, that means that we spend some time in the uterus of our mother. And the problem is that a lot of things can go wrong there. And whether you're a happy baby afterwards or whether you're a premature baby with problems or even like still is the case that you die in, in infancy. When you look at this, for example, then you see that the global death rate in infancy is still very, very high, especially in the developing world. And when you look at, the, first of all, the, the geographical kind of distribution, you see that there are still huge problems, for example, in Africa or Pakistan. But what is very interesting is to try to understand why this is happening. And when you look in the developed world, what you see is that it's mainly congenital abnormalities or low birth weight, which is very, very important. And we'll talk about that a bit later. But when you see in the developing world what you see, or in the, in the overall world, what you see is that there's also some other problems, but a lot of them come down to problems in utero, in infancy, in round birth, which are related to local remodeling. And in order to understand this remodeling and then further on try to see how we can try to attack this or try to first understand and then try to change this, is what's important is that we need to know what is different between the fetus and the adult. And when we look at the cardiovascular system, one of the things that is clear is that the lungs are not functioning in fetal life. And because of that, the lungs are shunted and there's like different ways for shunting of the lungs. And additionally, the lungs are replaced by the placenta, which has to be incorporated in the system. So what we will have is that the placenta is incorporated, blood goes to the placenta from the oxygenated blood with nutrition, goes then further on into the circulation, enters the circulation. And what we see is that there's between the left and the right heart, there's two types of shunts. 
One of the shunts is that there's an opening between the left and the right atrium. And next, that there's a connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. And so these connections and these changes actually make that the circulatory system of the fetus is quite different from the adult life. And some of the concepts, as you will see later on also, that we used to, to think in cardiology, in adult cardiology, or even in pediatric cardiology, actually are not necessarily valid in utero, and we really have to understand this and see what's going on there. Now, to understand cardiac function, and especially like cardiac deformation, and in total cardiac performance, it's extremely important to know the cardiac structure. And especially the cardiac microstructure of, is of interest, and this is also one of the things that will change with changing either genetic malformations or changing conditions in utero. And what you will see is that actually when you look at the cardiomyocytes, so the individual cells that, uh, that the, the tissue is made of, what you have to keep in mind that if you take one single cardiomyocyte, when they get electrically activated, they start to develop force, and they can shorten, but they can only shorten by 10, maximally 15%. And with that, you have to make a ventricle which is very kind of performant and can eject about 60% of its volume with every heartbeat. The only way that this can be is with a very, very specific structure organizations of these cells. And what you see is that these cells are organized in fiber-like structures. They are very longitudinal cells that contract and deform in their longitudinal direction. And they form fibers of which the direction is actually changing from the outside of the myocardial tissue to the inside. We see like there's a gradual change in fiber directions from what we call the epicardial layer to the endocardial layer. And here you nicely see how these fibers are arranged where you can follow almost the streamlines of these fibers. In, in this case, this is a red heart. And what you see there is that there's a complex structure and going to the point, the apex of the heart, we see that it really spirals. And thanks to this organization of the cells within the myocardium, we have very different components of contraction and the combination of these components of contraction can make the performance. And what we will see is if you look at the ventricle, in this case, for example, the left ventricle, what you see is that the valve plane, and you see that here is being dragged towards the apex. So you see that here, the, this plane moves towards the apex. At the same time, the circumference is being shortened, mainly by the circumferential uh, fibers. And then what you see is, of course, you have conservation of volume in tissue, which means that at the same time, the tissue thickens. And by these components and by this architecture, that's the way that we can really function as we do. And when we look at fetal life, obviously the structure is being formed, because that's when the cells are being formed. But what you will see also is that when you look at this as a human fetal heart, what you see here is that within this cavity, you see that there's like very, very much spongy tissue. And we see that this spongy tissue, what we call the trabeculations, is actually also developing during life. And here you see already, also this is like a zoom out of this, where you nicely see these different layers where you cut here in the longitudinal fibers. In the middle you have these circumferential fibers. And in the cavity you have this kind of spongy structure. And one of the things that obviously can happen is that all the structures, since it's so complex, that its formation can go wrong. And here you see an example of a congenital heart disease also in a human fetus where instead of nicely having this fiber orientation, which is very regularly, and which goes from the outside to the inside, and which is very similar when we go from the point towards the valve plane, when you have genetic abnormalities, and this is a very, very complex genetic abnormality, where there's also like a switching of the left and the right ventricle, where you have similar, well, like where you have two right atria instead of one, where you have one common AV valve, so a very, very complex congenital heart disease from the morphological point of view when you look at this heart. But what you see also when you go to this microstructure, and we can quantify this currently, what you see there, for example, is that in the apical part or the morphological right ventricle, you see that this fiber orientation is totally messed up. And you know that already, even if you correct, surgically correct the gross abnormalities, and these babies can go up to adulthood, you will see that these ventricles will stay very inefficient from the beginning. Or here's another example where you see the normal tissue. And this is tissue 
from a neonate that died after having aortic stenosis, severe aortic stenosis in utero, and what we call endocardial fibroelastosis because the pressure in the left ventricle is so high that the inner wall is really becoming fibrotic. And there you see that if you take a piece of tissue here, you see almost absolutely no structure anymore or no organized kind of organization of the myocytes. And again, we have surgery to correct for this and get these babies into childhood and sometimes adulthood. What you will see is that we have to take care that we still keep in mind that we have these changes in structure. Now, for those that are interested in this type of images, which I think are amazing and is starting to open up, and to me at least, a new field of research in cardiology where we can really look at a detailed microstructure, we do have things like tissue, uh, diff kind of diffusion tensor MRI for fibers and so on, but the resolution is of a total order of magnitude. And these images are actually taken by synchrotron phase contrast CT, which is CT where you not only look at absorption as regular CT would do, but where you also can look at wave propagation and based on that at phase shifts of the waves and thus get much more contrast in soft tissues. And we have a whole collaboration around this. And what you see that currently in the Swiss synchrotron, what you can see is that they even can start to do live imaging and look internally and the, at uh, the muscle organization and the movement of the muscle. And I think in the future, if we manage to get this into cardiology, we will learn a lot also about not only the microstructure, but also the deformation. And when you then look at some of these images, what you start to see is that actually the myocardium is very complex. And not only the myocardium, the tissue itself, when you look at the fiber structure, but when you look actually just at the inner side of the wall, is when you look at modeling people, most often they say like they have sometimes, even if it's like a personalized, it's still ellipsoid-like with a very, very smooth inner boundary, the endocardium being very smooth. But if you look at in reality, it's not that smooth at all. And when you look here at this beating heart, what you see, it's a very spongy structure with also these cords. It's like what we call false tendons going around. Actually, these are electrical shortcuts because there's Purkinje system inside. And so trying to understand, first of all, why we have this spongy-like structure, and next trying to quantify and compare it because this looks almost like a random structure but actually there's some organization and some similarities between different individuals and so we are also working on trying to understand this in much more detail and trying to quantify this. But what is important is that actually when you look at this spongy structure, at these trabeculations, it's actually as I already showed you with this fetal heart, it's changing during the development. And during fetal development, what we see is that we go from a very, very, very spongy structure towards much more organized tissue. And the reason for this is in a way very, very logical because at the beginning when the heart is forming, we do not have coronary arteries that can perfuse the tissue. So the only way you can get perfusion of the tissue, and it's already beating almost from the very early days in life, and obviously we need oxygen, we need nutrition, and the only way to provide this is through diffusion. But of course for diffusion you need a huge surface to volume ratio. And so you, very, you need this very spongy structure in the beginning in order just to be able to get perfusion. But later on, especially when you need to develop pressures, these spongy structures are not useful anymore and you need to get something more. And you can see that also it's like when during development you change the loading conditions. For example, you increase the pressure in the ventricle or you decrease the pressure in the ventricle, you see that this ratio of spongy myocardium to compact myocardium is actually changing. So actually trying to see what's happening during fetal life or changes during fetal life will actually change your morphology and will actually determine that you will have a different heart when you're born. And to try to understand how important this is or what the contributions of um, this trabeculations of the spongy network is to the myocardium, you can actually start to do modeling. And for that you can actually do very, very simple modeling and that's some modeling that has been done in our lab where we just take a simple geometry with very simple trabeculations and let us contract and see what the contributions are. Because here, for example, you see a frog heart and a frog heart is actually much more spongy than a human heart. And you will see that when you start looking at this, it's the ratio between the pressure and the volume, the performance against 
what does it need to do as work that will lead to some of these things. And when you look at these, these simulations, what you actually see is that trabeculations help in order to do more volume ejection with less deformation of the compact tissue. It's similar like a sponge. It's like while a sponge in itself, the material is obviously non-compressible, by the fact that you can change these cavities without really compressing the material that's around it, you can really displace volume from one place to the other. And you can see that when you look at the performance, when you look, for example, we need to have a certain stroke volume, you can see that with spongy myocardium, or with at least partially spongy myocardium, with less deformation of the total tissue, you can actually get more volume out. And as I said before, you have to keep in mind that the cardiomyocytes can only contract this 10%. So whatever can help in increasing the volume ejection will be very useful. Now, on the other hand, when we have for example, full spongy myocardium, well, obviously, at some point, this kind of tissue also takes space within the cavity, and your total intracavity volume goes down, and you can actually simulate with very simple kind of simulations what actually a good ratio is where you still have a reasonable size and, at the same time, a good stroke volume for as little deformation as possible. So while this is absolutely not fancy simulations, it can you learn you quite a lot on what's going down. And then you can also go further and really study this in more detail. And what you can do is this is like a project uh, that's going on together with, with Timothy Mohan in, in London, where they knock out genes of mice one by one in order to try to link the genotype phenotype. And that's mostly in, in fetal life also. And so you can really get High resolution, these are episcopic microscopy, so really like block face, kind of cutting layer by layer, and then make high resolution images. You can really start to quantify how this mesh network, how this spongy network is starting to change. And then you can really find ways to quantify this. And this is also, that's the thesis of Bruno Pound here in the lab, who is working on this. And by looking at this and trying to see how this changes, how this changes, with different genetic diseases, how this changes with different conditions in utero, we can try to understand the influence of fetal life later on on adult life. And that this influence is important is actually shown in this slide, where they already showed long time ago that when you take a map of cardiovascular disease and you take a map of the birth weights of the people 50 years ago, what you then see is that there's actually a close correlation. So it seems like when you're born with a low birth weight, you have higher risk of dying of cardiovascular diseases in adulthood. And so the question is like, why would this link be? Is this just pure statistics or is there a mechanistic link which is important? And what we say up to now is that our risk factors for cardiovascular diseases is mainly our lifestyle and our genetics. Actually, what seems to be the case is what happened when we were in the uterus of our mother is actually might also be quite important. And one of the things that you see, and what I was also saying is like, when you look at the child that's prematurity and low birth weight in itself around birth, in neonatal birth, especially in the developing world, makes that there's a, clearly a problem. And the problem that, that happens there is that actually when you look at fetal life, obviously all your contact with the outside world goes through the placenta. You get your oxygen, you get your nutrition through the placenta. And what you see is that in a certain percentage of babies, what you see that actually the placenta is underdeveloping and in such a way is not providing enough contact from the mother and the fetus. And this might obviously lead to problems. And when you start looking at this, it's actually reasonably prevalent in the sense that when you look at the amount of pregnancies where there's potential problems with the placenta, that goes from a range from about 5% to 10%. And if you want a very easy clinical way of saying like which was the baby at risk for this, well, if the fetal weight is below the 10th percentile, so you're within the 10% smallest babies, then there was a good chance that something goes wrong or something went wrong. Obviously, when your parents were very, very small, you will also be very small. So to try to figure out 
what are the differences or which are the, the kind of problems really related to the placenta, what we need to do is try to understand the changes that abnormal placentas will do within the fetus. And obviously, since the placenta is incorporated in the circulation, looking at hemodynamic remodeling is one of the ways in order to look at this. And when you look in clinical practice, what they start to see is like, when you have a normal placenta, what happens is, I told you before, is because you don't have lungs, what happens is that the blood that is ejected by the right heart, you would see that goes normally into the pulmonary artery and would normally go to the lungs, but since fetal lungs almost don't take any blood, the blood has to go somewhere else. And that's what we see here is that's what we call through the ductus arteriosus, which is the connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. And normally the volume being ejected by the right heart would go through the ductus and then goes to the periphery, going to the peripheral organs, but also go to the placenta in order to get oxygen. Because it came from the right side of the heart and that is deoxygenated blood, obviously. So this is the normal way that it would work. But you can already imagine that if something goes wrong with the placenta and you have, for example, increased resistance in the placenta, what will happen is actually that the pressures will go up and what you then start to see is that the, instead of the blood from the right heart going to the aorta and the periphery, what actually happens is that you get reversal and that actually the blood goes towards the brain. For two reasons. One is that obviously since you have a higher resistance in the placenta, then the pressures will change. And the other reason is also what you get is like a fetus tries to protect, in brackets, the vital organs. And what you see there is that obviously if you have a lack of oxygen, a lack of nutrition, you want it to go to the brain, to the developing brain, since that is one of our most important organs. So this is what you see, and you can actually measure this, is when you start to look at the Dopplers, when you take Doppler ultrasound of the fetus, what you then can see is that when you, for example, look at the umbilical artery or the aortic isthmus, which is the connection of the ductus to the aorta, what you see is that actually you can measure this flow reversal. And now in current clinical practice, it's not only the low birth weight that you will try to check, because that also is, of course, after birth, but we know that fetuses with this kind of what we call growth restriction um, we, we know that they have a lot of problems or potential problems during birth or around birth or can even die already in uterus if the placenta is really underdeveloped. That means that we need to detect this really before birth. You can do that by doing estimated fetal weight uh, kind of based on the, the size of the fetus or the length of the femur or this kind of things. But you can also see it by doing the uh, proper ultrasound and look at these Doppler reversal changes and then try to understand what's going on. So this is what we see in clinical practice. But what we need to do is we need to understand more. It's like, why are these changes happening? What's the influence on the heart, for example? Is it just a hemodynamic change that at the moment that you get born, that that will go away? And then you say like, okay, it doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore. Or, as I also showed you before, are these changes in loading conditions, for example, these changes in hemodynamics, this distribution, would that also have an effect on the growth itself, on the development itself of the cardiovascular system? And so together with the group of the maternity clinic here in Barcelona, we have been doing quite a lot of work on this growth restriction now. And what you see is that you can do animal models and you can look at, at human models and you can really look at a multi-scale level. And you can try to get data at a multi-scale level, but obviously also use modeling at a multi-scale level in order to look at these things. And as I showed you before, we look at organs at the organ level and we try to look at the microstructure or something like the mesostructure. We look at cellular work and we can look even subcellularly. And some of the things that we have found is that actually intracellularly there are changes when you have this kind of abnormal conditions during fetal life. And you see that, for example, you get mitochondrial remodeling where not only the size but also the position of the mitochondria is changing. And you get even changes in sarcomere lengths. And all the modeling people and the, and the cardiac physiology people know that if you have changes in sarcomere length, you will have also changes in cardiac performance. And so, first of all, the quantification of these changes is quite important. But what is in 
as we're talking about modeling in this community, what's also important is try to see whether we can somehow capture these changes or try to see what the influence of these changes are. And so what we started to do here is try to make a model of a cell and a cell as an organ. Because when you look at these intracellular changes and you would zoom out to the cell, I mean the cell would be as complex, even more complex than for example when we look at the heart, because you have all these different organelles inside where there's a little bit like when you compare cells by cells, they're not that geometrically organized as a whole heart, but you still have organization, you still have structure, and you can do measurements. And here are, for example, measurements of contraction. So you do line scanning in this case in order to get a good temporal resolution where you can see contractions of isolated cells based on transmitted light, or you can look at T-tubal staining with confocal microscopy. And at the same time, you can also measure calcium gradients because we know the calcium gradient is the thing that will help or will, will make the contraction to take place. And so what we try to do there is, again, look at this cell as a modelable uh, organ in some ways where you can try to uh, describe the contraction of the cells, you can do finite element analysis, you make meshes, here is a, a, a validation that we did. But what you can nicely do is, of course, once you have this simulator and, once, and then you also have measurements from, from individual cells, what you can try to do is try to personalize these cells and try to see is like, are these intracellular changes relevant and how can you study them? And so this is, for example, this contraction model that was developed here in the lab by Patricia. Now, then going one scale upper, it's like, okay, can we see remodeling? Can we see changes in these diseases at a higher level? And when you look at these synchrotron images here, and the nice thing of these synchrotron images is also that you get at the same time the overall geometry, well, the detailed geometry with all the trabeculations, you get the fiber orientation that you can extract, but you can also see, for example, the vasculature. And here, Chong segmented the vasculature the coronary artery tree from these uh, images. And what you see there, if you start looking in a bit more detail, what you see is that actually the coronaries are really significantly larger when you had growth restriction. And again, in a way, this is logical, eh? because what you have is you have hypoxia and you have higher pressures, which means that the vessels need to be bigger in order to get more volume going through and likely are at a higher pressure and thus also structurally will change. And so you will see that because of this, you will get a remodeling. And you see here clearly these very, very large coronary arteries. So not only is the tissue structure changing, but also the composition of the different components will change. And this is important to understand what the influence will be. But what we also found from clinical studies, and this is in a way how I like doing clinical research, is what you do is you gather a lot of images, you get a lot of data, and you try to see what is changing. And sometimes you see very surprising changes because the first time we looked at images, this was actually of five-year-old children that were born with this growth restricted restriction, kind of been proven by the abnormal Doppler changes in the clinic. And when we started to look in detail, what you could see is that actually first we didn't measure it, we didn't have statistics, but then we said, okay, let's go and start looking at these images in more detail. Let's see whether we visually can see something. And then very consistently what we started to see is that the growth restricted heart is actually much more spherical with much more spherical ventricles and an overall much rounder heart than a normal heart. And then you start to think, yeah, okay, I mean, is this really something? And when you really start to measure it, then you see that there really are changes and then these hearts are globular. And what we actually found is that these hearts are globular in fetal life. These hearts are globular when the baby is born and they actually stay globular for now, we know for sure, up to when they're 12 years old, for example. So something that happened in utero will change the total geometry of your heart. And even when you look at these children, what you start to see is that the vasculature, when you look at the thickness of the vessels, that that's also changing. But again, when you think about it, when you have these abnormal pressures, you will see that obviously you have a reaction to pressure loading where you will have thicker corner, uh, kind of vessels overall. And you will see that actually when you're really born with this. And then when you start to look at what is relevant, how can you in clinical practice then get this out, then you start to see that 
structure and function is the thing that has really changed. And as I said, I told you before, is what they use in clinical practice is they use to look at these Dopplers. But when you later on see, it's like when the babies are born, you see that these, the, the, the Dopplers and the hemodynamics are actually not changing anymore because obviously the placenta is taken out of the circulation. But what you start to see is that cardiac structure and cardiac deformation is still changed. And then, of course, we come in again and saying like, okay, how can we understand this? And obviously, their modeling can come in because we know what's happening when we have a certain geometry and when you pressurize this geometry and how different types of geometries, whether it's a more like elongated ellipsoid ventricle or a more spherical ventricle, how they will change the loading within the heart, how they change the stresses, but actually also how they change the performance of the heart. Because what you see is that if you have a more spherical heart, well, obviously, when you take with a certain pressure, your wall stresses will be lower because the more spherical, the lower the wall stresses would be. But what you see there is that the performance, the output of such a ventricle is not good. And so what you see is like when you go in fetal life, we get a more global ventricle because of the loading conditions. However, when this global ventricle happens during development, we see that it never regresses and you're born with a global heart and we can simulate and we can measure that these are actually less efficient hearts. And what you see is that actually when you look at a normal heart, how a normal heart reacts on a sudden increase in pressure. For example, when you go outside into the snow when you're living in a cold country suddenly, or even when you go to the toilet and you have a sudden increase in pressure of the heart, what you will see is that actually the ventricle reacts by becoming a little bit more spherical in order to try to lower the wall stresses as much as possible when you have this pressure in so. But obviously, if you would be born with a very spherical heart, you cannot become more spherical anymore in this context. So not only when you have a spherical ventricle, you're less efficient from the output way, but you additionally are lacking a mechanism that can cope with daily life changes and changes in pressure. And again, you can try to simulate this, and this is also some work that Patricia did in the lab, is trying to see like if you have different kind of geometries and you would suddenly load these geometries, how would be the redistribution of wall stresses and whether this could be um, kind of deleterious or not. Now, what I told you is we have persistent changes in the um, geometry of the ventricle. And this actually, when you also go back to what I said before, it's like we have a certain geometry, but within the tissue you have these fiber orientations. And obviously when you change the overall geometry, you will also change the reorganization or the, you do a reorientation of these fibers. And one of the things that you see is that actually these children, when you look at the motion from, of the base towards the apex, what we call the longitudinal deformation, which is actually a very, very important component for volume ejection, that you see that this is actually reduced uh, and it actually stays reduced over at least up to the childhood or, or kind of early adulthood that we can know now. Now, very interestingly, it's not only growth restriction, but there's also many other fetal conditions that actually will change uh, the formation of the heart and the geometry. So intrauterine growth restriction, what we see, it gives you a biventricular change in the geometry. But what we actually see is that also in vitro fertilization or maternal diseases, in this case maternal diabetes, will actually also change the geometry of the heart, but it does it differently. For example, when we look at babies born after in vitro fertilization, what we see there is that's actually predominantly the right ventricle which is changing in geometry and much less the left. We still don't know exactly why this would be, whether it's because of the cell manipulation of the embryo kind of uh, before the fertilization or whether it's something during pregnancy. This is still to be found out and I hope that, for example, also modeling with help will help us there. Now, I just show you first the slide of what we see in adulthood, in adult cardiology, and we are already quite used to this concept of what we call post-systolic deformation. Because what you see is like if you take a normal heart, a normal adult heart, and you look, for example, at the deformation of the septum during the cardiac cycle, so you get contraction and then you get relaxation. And you see that normal myocardium in all the segments would deform more or less the same. 
However, when you look at a patient with high blood pressure, with hypertension, what we start to see, well, that first of all, what you see is that there's a kind of localized hypertrophy in the basal part of the septum, where it becomes thicker. But what we also see is that there's actually a change in the deformation there. And what we see is that in this basal thicker part, what we see is that actually there's first stretching instead of contraction, then contraction, but much less than the normal segment. And then after aortic valve closure, we see something which looks like contraction, but of course it does not contribute to ejection because the valve is already closed. And this is what we call post-systolic deformation. And again, to try to understand this, because then first when we, when we uh, found this out, we actually found this all, it was first known in coronary artery disease, because when you do an occlusion of a coronary artery, disease, uh, a coronary artery you will actually see this phenomena also. And when we first discussed this with the cardiologist and they said like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's like a perfusion problem and you just have late contraction and that's it, that's causing it. But late contraction means really late contraction. Eh? I mean, this absolutely, at least in my opinion, it's very difficult to explain that you here do the electrical excitation and that so much later you will get this contraction. So then we started to think, it's like, how can we understand this? And here again, modeling can come in. And what you do is you can make a model, a, even a relatively simple geometrical spring model, where you look at contraction properties and you change the active contractile force. You can put measured pressures in there and you solve the equations from the tissue. And this is a thing that Piet Klaus did at the time that I was in Leuven also. And then you can really see that if you change the active stress, the more you reduce the active contractile force, the more you will see that you go towards a kind of less deformation and post-systolic deformation. And also when you have a bit longer prolonged contraction, you will get post-systolic. And when you change the elasticity, for example, when you have scar tissue, you don't have post-systolic anymore. And the explanation that we found is that it's actually the interaction of neighboring segments, the elastic interaction of segments that had deformed differentially during the contraction, that that is actually causing this phenomena. So what you see there, and especially then also when you think about this hypertensive case, when you start thinking about why would you have this specifically in this basal part of the septum, then again when you start to think about regional loading, you will see that actually the septum is the flattest region there. So the Laplace stress will be the highest. So because of changes in loading, you will see that that's where the changes are taking place. And if we then go back to our fetuses, is at some point when we started to look at this and we started to measure deformation in fetuses, what we started to see is that actually some of these fetuses would also show this phenomena of post-systolic deformation in the basal part of the septum. And then what you start to see is that you see this pattern that we, that we had previously known from hypertension in adulthood, we start to see in fetuses. And so we actually have a hypertensive fetus. And it turns out that the growth-restricted fetuses, where the placenta is abnormal, that they very often show this phenomenon. And obviously, it's not possible to measure the pressures in fetal life, at least not in human fetuses. But we start to see by the change in this geometry, by becoming more spherical, by seeing specific changes in the deformation, we can actually try to understand and infer that there's this abnormal pressure loading. And when we then look also at later life, and as I told you before, it's like we're doing, we're looking at a cohort of children that we known were born with growth restriction and that are now around 10, 12 years old. And when we look at these, well, first of all, when we look at the geometry, you can prove that there are still geometrical changes and you can nicely do this kind of PCA analysis there. But one of the things that you also see is that there's still this prevalence of post-systolic deformation. So that means that even though the pressures are relatively normalized, they might have slightly higher blood pressures, but that doesn't explain all of this. And what was actually even more surprising is that we started to see, when you look in detail at these children, what you started to see is actually that they showed post-systolic deformation in the free wall, in this case, the basal lateral wall. While normally what we see with pressure loading, with hypertension, you would always see it in this segment, but in these children we started to see it in this segment. And before we had only known this as being abnormal deformation, more exaggerated than this, in some genetic cardiomyopathies. Like for example, Fabry disease, that's like a typical one where we see these changes here.
So now you're going to ask yourself, okay, I mean, what's going on? But now when you start thinking about it, is because of their geometrical remodeling, so we told you before, like in fetal life, there is this more sphericity, and you see then that actually this geometrical changes uh, keep on happening. And what you see now in these children is actually it's not the septum necessarily, which, which is like the one with the highest Laplace stress, but because of this more sphericity, the spherical remodeling, you start to see that actually in these segments you start to see the changes. And so by combining imaging, seeing, looking at this deformation, analyzing it, looking at the geom geometrical changes, and do the modeling to try to understand what this phenomena means actually, you can start to interpret what's going on there and try to find ways in order to first of all interpret this, but then maybe at some point also modulate this. And one of the things that you see then also is like then you start to think, of course, I told you before, there is this relationship between low birth weight and cardiovascular problems. And we try to unravel this now a little bit more, and this is in collaboration with the University of Zagreb. And what we start to see is that actually when you look at low birth weight, that there's some interesting things where um, different type of cardiac abnormalities at adulthood are starting to come in. And one of the things that you see, for example, is that it seems to be, although our numbers are still rather low, that there's more myocarditis, which is like infection or infective reaction of the, of the tissue, which can be really deadly if not kind of found early, early on, but which is also treatable. It seems like this kind of happens more in these babies. And then now, one of the next things we need to do is, of course, is there maybe a relation between the remodeling that happened at some point and the risk of having cardiac problems when you get a viral infection. And so this opens up a whole new line of research that we can start to look at and trying to understand this relation, but also trying to understand much more of adult disease. But what I said in the beginning is that actually the way that they currently clinically would detect whether fetuses in utero are having growth restriction is by looking at the hemodynamic changes. And as I told you before, the main thing is what you see is that you see hemodynamic changes, but you see them actually in all parts of the body. You see, for example, there is more flow going to the brain, and there is this reversal of flow around the aortic isthmus, where flow from the ductus is now going to the brain instead of the periphery. And what you also see is that actually this is gradually changing with severity of the disease in some ways. So when you look in clinical practice, the more severe this growth restriction is, the more risks actually the baby has on problems around birth. Because, of course, having an ID on cardiovascular problems at later life is important. But what is much more important is obviously that the baby has to be born alive and without too many complications. And you see that there's this gradual change in these patterns of flow. Obviously also, in order to try to understand this better, the best way, or at least one way we think is really useful, is trying to make models. But obviously making like a 3D, very complex model of the whole circulation of the fetus is not feasible or not possible, or at least very, very, very difficult. So what we started to do, and that was the thesis of Patricia, is looking at trying to see whether we could use lumped hemodynamic models where we compartmentalize the uh, fetal circulation in order to try to understand it. And one of the things also is like, it's notoriously difficult to make a very good model of a beating heart. It's still, although there's a lot going on, it's still very difficult to do that in my opinion. What you can relatively easily do is of course do measurements and take the flow that comes out of the heart, out of the left and the right heart and use this as input for the model then make, of course, the electrical equivalent model where each of the pieces of the vasculature can be described and can be individually changed. Because one of the things I also told you is when you have growth restriction, you will have changes in thickness of the vessels, for example. So you have to be able to control this. And then, of course, also you have to be able to control the kind of the loading or the, the kind of the peripheral part, not the vascular part. And you need to be able to model the placenta also. And when you do this modeling, when you create this modeling, now you can start to do, for example, parametric studies and saying like, okay, if we have changes in this part, for example, if we have changes in the resistance of the placenta, or if we have what people think, if we would have vasodilation in the brain in order to increase the flow there to be protective, how is this changing 
these flows that we can measure really in clinical practice. And there you see, for example, that with increasing abnormalities of the placenta, you indeed can model, you can perfectly nicely model this reversal of flow, where you see that flow goes in a different direction. And then you can study which are the most important, for example, how the periphery, how the placenta is important, how the changes in the brain could be important. But besides doing parametric studies, of course, when you have data from individual fetuses, what you can try to do is you can try to personalize this model. And so what you can do is you can actually measure these flows and you can try to fit the model in such a way that you can also simulate these flows. And the nice thing is that obviously when you do this, then you can try to extract new parameters or other parameters from these models. And for example, measuring directly the resistance of the placenta or for example, the compliance of the placenta where nobody talks about compliance of placenta. But obviously, since the placenta is a very kind of complex structure where you have this interaction between the fetal circulation and the maternal circulation, you could already think that the elasticity of this whole, even as bulk, but obviously as detail, might be of some importance. And it could be that you have too little vessels in such a way that your resistance will increase, but it could be also that the properties of your vasculature is changing so that your compliance is changing. And so this is a thing that we did also in a group of fetuses, of normals and abnormal fetuses with growth restriction. What we started to do is if you personalize this model, you can really extract and indeed the resistance of the placenta, for example, the resistance of the whole brain or changes in the coronary arteries. And you see that there are changes. But what I think is very, very interesting is like when you look at adverse perinatal outcome, which means that if there's problems during birth, it could be dying, but much more like if there's stress problems, the, the, the fetus needs to go into kind of premature care and this kind of things. What you see is that the growth restricted have changes in the placental uh, resistance, for example, but what you also see is that the ones which really have problems around birth, they also have changes in the placental compliance. And this is something we didn't know up to now. And so we can start to think, it's like, okay, how can placental changes induce this? And then can we find indeed a measure to clinically look at this? And it seems to be that this prediction is actually better than the one just using the Doppler images. And so this can give you not only understanding of what can be important in remodeling, but it also can tell you or can give you new measurements, new biomarkers in some ways that can help you in trying to predict the problems. And then also once you have this, of course, you can also look, for example, at some academic problems. Eh? And like one discussion that is in or that was in the literature of the obstetricians was, for example, you see this kind of little notch when you look at this flow. And people, some, there were, were like two groups of people. Some people said like, okay, this is something which is physiological and you see it at the end of the pregnancy. And others said, no, 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 no. This is just a, a, a kind of measurement error and kind of we should totally neglect it. And now again, by doing modeling and trying to change all the parameters that might influence this, what we have shown is that it's actually the imbalance, the change in the right versus the left heart that will cause this kind of little notch. And what you start to see is that while in adult life, the left ventricle is the most important, obviously, because it supports the, the systemic circulation and at high pressures, what you actually see is that, especially at the end of the pregnancy, in the fetus is actually the right heart, which is very, very important. And there is a change in right versus left heart, in especially the last weeks of the pregnancy, and that's actually causing this. In a way, it's an academic discussion, but it also shows you, in a way, the power of modeling, where you can really try to figure out which are the things that might cause this, and at some point, of course, reverse this and trying to say, like, this prediction, or I can predict that doing this measurement can tell you something that might be useful. And so you see that using even very, very simple lumped models of the fetal circulation, but trying to model the things which are clinically relevant using clinical data that you can get, you really can get a wealth of information. And I think that's one of the strengths of modeling in this case. And obviously we try to do more than growth restriction with this model. And this is a study where we try to model the fetuses of mothers that had diabetes during the pregnancy. And what you see is that very often, especially in the past, when the diabetes of the mother was not controlled very well, instead of very small children, we get very, very big children. 
Now, if there's a good insulin control, this can be kind of kept uh, more or less in balance and we get normal sized children. But what you still see is when you start to model this, you see that there is a remodeling in the fetal circulation. Where you see that because of this diabetes of the mother, what you apparently see is that the placenta now is overdeveloped in some ways. And by this overdevelopment of the placenta, which likely will give you like almost like hyperoxygenation, what we'll see is actually that the heart and especially the cerebral vasculature is partially underdeveloping. And that's also that fits with clinical practice where you see that these babies that are born after, uh, from mothers with diabetes, they first have neural problems in the beginning and cognitive problems. And you can see that actually this is probably partially caused by some hemodynamic remodeling in fetal life. And then you can also go to looking, trying to model, uh, for example, congenital abnormalities. And here is a congenital abnormality called aortic coarctation that we try to look at. And in aortic coarctation, what you get is that the aorta at some point becomes narrowed. And what you see is like, but it can be narrowed at different places. It can be proximal or distal from the ductus, or it can be almost the whole aortic arch. And this is a very severe condition because when these babies are born, what you will see is that because of this stenosis, you get a severe pressure loading of the left ventricle. And unless you treat this kind of very, very early on in the severe cases, these babies will die from heart failure. Now, the problem is that it's very difficult, or it's notoriously difficult to detect this in fetal life. Of course, when the baby is born, you immediately see that something is wrong, but we want to predict this on forehand, of course, because what you have to make sure that in these babies, for example, the ductus will never close, because, for example, in this case, if this ductus would close, you would have almost no flow to the periphery, and of course, you get multi-organ failure. So we really need to know this, because the treatment in the early hours and days will be very, very important. However, unfortunately, we cannot image this directly. Our current ultrasound imaging is not good enough to detect this, really the geometry, in utero. What they currently use in clinical practice is a very indirect way of looking at that. And what they actually found is that when you look at the heart, what you see is that in babies that have a coarctation, what you see is that actually the right heart becomes much, much, much bigger than the left heart. Well, I told you that there's a little bit of right dominance when you go towards the, the, the late weeks of, of, of pregnancies. There should not be, and especially not in earlier pregnancies, there should not be this much of an imbalance. And people have found that this seems to be predictive of aortic coarctation. And everybody thought that it's, yeah, okay, it's of course because you have the stenosis, you have a higher pressure in the left ventricle. So obviously you have a problem in the development of the left ventricle. Now what we said is like, okay, we have this fetal model. Maybe we can try to look at more hemodynamic changes and by combining different Dopplers from different places, we might be able to kind of start to uh, predict this better. And so this is an, an, on, an ongoing uh, study, which is actually one of our master students who came to the summer school last year. So if you're interested in doing this type of research, you're very, very welcome. And what she did is develop this um, model of the fetal circulation a little bit further. We also started to use open source instead of MATLAB for this, so Salamel and OpenCore, in order to try to make it more available, of course, to the community. And one of the things that we did there is trying to see, okay, can we model specifically this coarctation? And so what you do is you add this additional segment and you can look at different kind of morphologies, at different topologies, where you can add these resistances, either proximal or distal from the ductus. You can involve several segments, depending on how it goes to the brain. And then again, you can start to simulate, and you can start to see, okay, what is the thing that influences the changes in the hemodynamics? Which are the things that might trigger the remodeling? And then try to understand this better, and at some point, hopefully, we're not there yet, find better clinical markers in order to detect this and thus try to save more lives. And one of the things that you see there is like when we want to, to model this, obviously we want to model the different scenarios. Obviously you want to model different degrees of stenosis because if you only have a little obstruction, it's probably not going to be important. If you have a 90% obstruction, it's likely going to give you trouble. So you want to see how this is changing. And then knowing that in clinical practice they use this imbalance of left and right ventricle, we would also look at 
what the influence of this imbalance would be if you change the output of the left and the right ventricle. And obviously, again, to make this relatively realistic or as realistic as possible, we currently don't have a lot of data to fit to, but what we used is we used the information that we had from our previous studies on a normal fetus with a certain age, because what you see is that obviously during fetal development, the baby is growing, the vessels are growing, the size, the stiffness, all of this kind of is, is growing. So you, also, you, you necessarily have to put all this in your models. But then you can start to look at the different geometrical configurations with the different kind of reductions in the, in the flow. And one of the things that you notice immediately is that when you start to look at the changes, it's only in changes of about 80% of stenosis, then you start to see that there's changes in the flow. And actually this fits very well with something that they have seen before. It's like, unless you have a severe stenosis, it's not going to be inducing a lot of changes in the circulation. So it will, first of all, not be detectable, but also clinically it's not that relevant. It might be that the child then will need treatment, but there will not be any fetal problem, at least very, very early on. And so what you can do then is obviously, since you have models, you can measure what this pressure drop over the stenosis is. And a pressure drop is something that, although we cannot directly see the vessels, what we can do is we can try to estimate pressure drops with Doppler measurements. And so when you, when you manage in a certain fetus to look at this Doppler flow, in a lot we cannot, but if you uh, can measure it, what they have shown in clinical practice is that a pressure drop of 20 millimeter mercury is something which is significant for the outcome. And that's the cutoff that they use clinically in order to say, okay, this really is a coarctation that needs care. And what we see is that actually at this pressure drop, this is indeed when there's 80% stenosis. So with our simulations, we could predict that indeed 20 uh, millimeter mercury would be a pressure drop where you would see changes in the hemodynamics. So this already gives us a little bit of confidence in the uh, modeling. But if we then start to look, for example, at the pressures in the left ventricle in the model, then we start to see like, hmm, something is going wrong here. Because what you see is that you get pressures in the left ventricle when you get these stenosis of up to, for example, 90 millimeter mercury, while in a fetal life, pressures are very, very low. They should be more in the order of 40 millimeter. So this is something which is actually totally irrealistic. There's no way that you can have a ventricle in fetal life that will develop this kind of pressures. So that means that our model is wrong. So the question is, okay, what's going wrong? Well, the thing what we modeled is, we modeled just the occurrence of the stenosis. We didn't modeling anything else. So that's clearly not enough. But then when you start to model this change in the proportion of the left and the right ventricle, what you see is if you make the right ventricle more dominant in output and the left ventricle smaller, what you start to see is that actually these pressures start to normalize. So now we start to understand this like, why do you have this ventricular disproportion? Is that because of the abnormal loading of the left ventricle? Or is this also a mechanism with which the fetal, fetus can cope in order to normalize the whole circulation? And you see that by having a certain amount of disproportion of the left and the right ventricle, you start to come again with your pressures in the physiological range. And then you start to see, and we're starting to look now in more of this data, and we start to see that actually maybe this left ventricle is not very pressure loaded, but actually we get a remodeling and we get a saving of the left ventricle by this imbalance of left and right. And here our model now has generated a new hypothesis that we are now trying to test in clinical practice. And it seems to be that indeed what we predict with the model is that it is the imbalance in the left and right, thus lowering the left pressures rather than the pressure induced by the stenosis itself, which is causing this type of remodeling. And now our next uh, thing is, of course, if we have this imbalance and we need to now start to personalize this, what you start to see is that now there are different changes in the uh, circulation. You start to see this reversal of flow again in the aortic isthmus, depending on what is the severity of the stenosis and what is the, the kind of the really the geometry, the morphology that you see in the stenosis. But one of the things that we now start to see is that, for example, when you look at your cerebral artery or your umbilical artery, there's now hypothesis generating kind of uh, curves that say like, maybe we should start to look at the shape 
rather than reversals of this curve. And these are things that we're currently trying to figure out with the obstetricians. So to conclude this, what I think is like, when you look at fetal life, cardiac development and fetal conditions is crucial, first of all, for normal development, but it's actually also potentially giving you a different heart with different working conditions that we have to take care of, that we have to understand, that we have to recognize for later on. And what you actually see is that even just very, very simple models, very simple geometrical models can tell us, for example, about trabeculations, about post-systolic deformation. When we use lumped models for the hemodynamic circulation, we can already understand a lot of things. And what we have shown is that actually it not only helps to understand, but it actually helps to formulate a hypothesis why these changes are taking place. And it gives us also a way to predict new parameters that could be useful in the future in clinical practice. And it's by looking at this combination where we look at individual data, individual patients, and then try to do population studies, whether we use modeling, simple modeling, more extensive modeling, we incorporate machine learning, whatever we want. The main thing is like to go from data towards a hypothesis, trying to test this, and then feed it back from the individual to the population. And again, I think that's the most important. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bart, for the great talk. Are there any questions? If not, I can start, maybe. <laughs> so I was wondering about the measurements, because I guess this <laughs> is a, an extremely challenging <laughs> task to do. Uh, could you comment a bit about the reliability? You said that flow measurements can be done in all the cases, and how trained need to be the, the clinician to do that. Exactly. I think this is a, a, a very, very good point, and it actually took us a while to train the physicians in order to give us data that we could use for the modeling. And you can talk to Patricia also how it was really important to try to get the good traces. And for example, with Doppler, we know that there's a problem with the angle and we really need to do angle correction in order to do this modeling because otherwise the data is totally useless. And you see that indeed a lot of data is actually cannot be used, at least not immediately. Or for example, our study in diabetic children was again with an outside hospital in the US. And again, it took a few of iterations in order to make sure that we got the right traces that could be used for, for, for the modeling. Now, the thing is like with the modeling, of course, you want to fit it as good as possible to the data, but you have to keep in mind that your data is indeed not perfect. And if you capture data specifically for modeling and you train the physicians doing this, I think you can get reasonable data. However, this is not easily translatable into clinical practice. There's no way that we can now say, okay, every clinician can use this model. You just take your standard clinical measurements and you put it in. This will not be possible. The measurements are not good enough. It's on the wrong place, the wrong angle, kind of that something is missing. It's too noisy. So in that sense, it's like, I think these models are really, really important to, as I said, to understand it, to predict new parameters, but probably to go to clinical practice we will not be able to do the personalized model. But nowadays, what, I, what we are trying to do now, and we're trying to do this now, for example, in a project with Pakistan, as I said, where, where childbirth, uh, child death is really, really a big problem. What we try to do is see, like, with our understanding that we have now, with knowing which parameters are important, can we, with larger data sets of real clinical practice, even with cheap devices, and combine that with machine learning techniques, can we maybe find ways to do this in an easier way? And I think, again, it's this combination of like, you need to have knowledge, you need to have like, okay, this is what I'm looking for, and uh, in order to prove this, you use more comprehensive techniques, but we need to somehow translate this into something which is easier in order to look at. Similarly, what I showed you with the synchrotron data, it's extremely difficult to get it, but probably in the future, if we do it well, we might be to able to translate this type of technology into regular CT scanners and then get more information from the heart out of that also. So it's this pipeline, I think, of research, hypothesis generating, hypothesis testing, and then trying to translate it into clinical practice. I think this is something which is very, very important. Hi, Bar. Thanks for the, for, the for the presentation. I would like to ask you if you, or have you think to include all the uh, circulation of the of the mother. Yeah, instead of the placenta, just to include the old full circulation of the mother, for example, how happen if 
uh, the mother has hy hypertension, for example. Exactly. Well, I think that's a very, very good point because one of the things is, especially when you look at prematurity, there's things that they call like preeclampsia, which is related to high blood pressure of the mother, for example, and it's actually closely related to growth restriction. So that's indeed an important thing. The thing is, up to now, we haven't done it. There's two reasons. Is first of all, a placental model is something we haven't developed yet, and which is also not that easy to do, at least not a, a kind of a detailed model. Other people are working on this, so maybe in the future we can do that. But the other thing is also is that when you go to obstetricians, they normally don't take measurements of the heart of the mother because you need a different machine. You need a different echo machine. You need a different probe. So it's not something which is routinely available. And although, indeed, I think it's very interesting and I'm very interested in it myself, but up to now, because of the combination of resources and collaborators that are able and willing to do it, which is mostly resource-related, we haven't been. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you get this spherical abnormality in the heart even when in cases where the baby has come out of in vitro fertilization. Um, do you know if, uh, so sometimes with these in vitro fertilizations you get like multiple, uh, you have twins or, or triplets. It, do, you, do, do you know if there's data available on the twins whether they both sets have similar abnormalities? Um, I think they do indeed. Uh, whether they're exactly the same, I'm not completely sure. But there's quite some um, information now also. It's like, for example, there's clearly some pulmonary remodeling of, with, with babies of, uh, after in vitro fertilization. There's a couple of very interesting studies where they took children, normal children, and, well, normal in vitro fertilization are also normal in brackets, as we know, and they took them high up in the Alps and then actually saw that the in vitro fertilization ones got more pulmonary hypertension. So there is something going on at the right side of the heart, at the lung circulation or whatever. We still don't know exactly what is going on and why this is going on, but there's clearly something. It's like in vitro fertilization doesn't give you totally, totally normal uh, children. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I, I was uh, thinking of two things. So the first thing is related to pressure. Uh, and whether you think there might be any relation between pressure of the amniotic fluid and pressure of the heart, particularly in this restricted growth where the heart is bigger, and related to this, whether is it something that we can measure through the pressure of the transducer on the mother or, or perhaps in another way? Um, yeah. Uh, this, is, this is a very interesting question. Actually, I've never thought of this before, so it's <laughs> like, I think it's a really nice remark. The thing is, so I have no clue. Um, I would doubt whether it makes a huge difference, but now, it, yeah, I, I think it, if it makes a difference, I think it would, would mainly be in loading of the placenta rather than the fetus, I would imagine. The thing is, I don't know, eh? there's no data, but if you look also in adulthood, it's like what you see is like, okay, external pressure does something in your heart, but not in such a way, I think, that it would lead to, to fetal remodeling, but the thing that might be important is obviously when you have pressure on the placenta, that will change its properties. And there also probably the stiffness will change and so on. So I guess looking at looking more at placental properties related to um, amniotic pressure, that I think might be indeed very interesting. And obviously indirectly that will that might induce growth restriction. Eh? So that might be indeed another factor. Yeah. Uh, and, and the other question is about uh, how the data is collected. So. Um, in, in fetuses, because normally when they have some disease, it, it might not necessarily be felt or, or manifested as a symptom by the mother. So we rely on screening. They have to go without knowing whether they are healthy or not. Um, so because we don't know necessarily what we are trying to find out, uh, this is why the detection rate is so low as well. Um, and also in ultrasound, people are following a protocol and acquire just a very small number of images and so on. So the question is, do you think this limited number of measurements are driving how you build your models because it depends on what data you have available? And if yes, do you think maybe the screen should be changed to acquire much more data which might not be uh, useful a priori for diagnosis, but perhaps is data that you can use to do modeling and research and so on? Yeah. 
I think that's also a very relevant issue in the sense that, but what you also have to keep in mind is like, there's two things eh, when you look in, in, in fetal life. It's one of the things is you need to detect whether there's gonna be problems in the first days of life, because later on you can solve it or you can detect it later on. So this is a very important issue. And I think for that we're starting to do, at least in the developed world, reasonably well um, by, by doing the regular ultrasound scans. The other thing is like looking at the subtle remodeling that then really might cause changes. I don't think we're doing that well. The thing is we also don't understand yet whether these changes are really, really important. Eh? So we don't have any direct link yet of fetal growth restriction, for example, with adult abnormalities. We only have statistics that there might be a correlation. It's only now that the cohorts are starting to be followed up, which are probably defined. So in that sense, we still don't know whether we, we indeed are missing things and missing people, but probably that's the case. But you see, for example, when you, when you look at heart failure in adulthood, what we start to see is that there's especially this group of, of patients with what we call heart failure preserved ejection fraction. Actually, we still don't know what to do with them because there's no treatment that as a group will work out. And what we start to think more and more is that when you take this group of heart failure, that there's actually a couple of different kind of phenotypes. They might be related to genotypes, but it might be that some of these, that there's a subgroup where it's indeed intrauterine conditions that will determine that they will have heart failure later on. And the thing is like, we still need to identify these adult populations and then link it to the, the fetal part and then see whether indeed there might be parameters that we missed or not. So, I'm not sure that at this moment acquiring a lot more data will help us. What at this moment would help us is acquiring the right data, let's say it that way, because looking at these different Dopplers where you take at least three or four Dopplers, that's not done in a lot of, of, of clinical places. Eh? So that I think is, but we first need to show that this is really relevant. That it's relevant, first of all, in the <coughs> obstetric world, which means the first day of life, so it's so all kind of perinatal, like, pre-birth problems, stillbirths, and things like that. So that's one thing that we need a very, very strong correlation, and that's what people are doing. And then we need this correlation with later in life. So we, I think we have to provide more evidence in this. And I think more modeling would, would really help. Eh? And especially also, it's like, what we now should, should do in, in the modeling community is trying to do is like, okay, how would a heart like this age? So what would be the aging if you have structural changes, if you have this, if your condition change, how would this heart react to, for example, pressure loading or to smoking or whatever it's like. And that's where I think we might be able to start to collect enough data, but we really need to make these like growth models in order to try to understand what's going on there. Thanks. Just one question maybe about the See the dynamics in the sense, is there any longitudinal follow-up like during pregnancy? Like do you integrate measurements over time? Or is there a critical timing? Could you comment about that? Yeah, because there's also, there's always this, this uh, point of this discussion when you need to do screening also of the mother. Eh? It's like doing ultrasounds is good, doing a lot of ultrasounds is bad because ultrasound is actually not that good for the fetus. So you need to say like, plus also doing a lot of ultrasounds is not good for the economy neither, so because you need to pay for it. So you need to find a balance. And I think this balance is kind of difficult. Eh? What they do now is they do the screening around 20, 22 weeks. That's, that's like where they normally do. The problem is that a lot of these growth restrictions we currently cannot detect there. Unfortunately, this is currently done with the regular Doppler measurements, which are very simple measurements of pulsatility index or something like that. So, and these with normal statistical programs are not good enough. I have a little bit of hope that some machine learning techniques might improve this. So then again, we could be able to extract more information out of that. But then later on, there's in a later scan, then you can start to, to detect things more. Right? But there's very little data where you really have a regular follow-up of these babies because one of the things is also like it might be 5% of the babies and it's extremely difficult to do a study of hundreds of mothers where you would do regularly a scan. It's a combination of ethical, organizational, and economically it's very, very difficult to do that. So I haven't seen a lot of this data. We don't have it. We have mostly sometimes two time points, uh, I think in the best case. I don't think we have much more. So. It's mainly by cross-sectional studies rather than, than kind of follow-up studies that we try to do these things. The only thing you can do is obviously in the, in, in the animal models you could do some of these things. Eh? But there again, we haven't, at least as far as I know, a lot of like longitudinal data.
Okay, any other question? If not, let's thank Bart again. <laughs>